I entitled this message, <laughs> Are You Willing to Go? Now, when, when you look around the world, you will discover that there is a lot of suffering, there's a lot of evil, there's a lot of bad things happening, you know, we pray, those of us who believe in God, you know, we pray that somehow, you know, there's a lot of crime, a lot of corruption, and so on and so forth. And then we, oftentimes, we, uh, we wonder, is God even concerned? Is He doing something? Why does it seem like evil is the one overtaking good? That we are more aware of the bad things that are happening. We, we see it on... Um, television, we see it in the movies, we see it, we read it in the papers, we hear it when we talk to our friends, there are more bad things that are happening. So many, and in the process, there are so many people that are broken, and so many people that are hurting because of this evil that is, that, that we constantly rub elbows with. And um, many people don't know that they are in bondage to, to fear, for example, or to, to hurt. They're, they're, they're in bondage to unforgiveness. You know, many people don't even realize that they're in bondage to these things. Some people are aware, and some people are aware, but they are resigned because they don't know what to do about it. They don't know how to be set free. They're bound, you know, just like, just like uh, we were singing earlier, uh, you know, uh, that I've been set free. The chains are broken and everything, but but it seems like there are more people that are bound than those who are free. And those who are bound want to be free, but they don't know how. And so oftentimes they are resigned to their situation. And so it seems like that perhaps God is indifferent, like He doesn't care. And it's like your problem. You guys did this anyway, so you figure this out. Or God is blind, perhaps. Or worse, maybe God is dead. And that's what some people are advocating, that perhaps God is dead. And the proof is all this crime and corruption and injustice and human trafficking and pornography and, and, and so on and so forth, all these things. And if God really is alive and if He is good, why are all these things happening? If He is all-powerful, why is He allowing these things to happen? Can He not stop it? Well, I want to be able to address this particular question and find out what really is wrong. Is there something wrong with God? And if nothing is wrong with God, then what's wrong? So I want to turn to Exodus chapter 3. If you have your Bibles or Bible apps, if you don't, I have it up here. Okay. And starting with verse 7, this is where God and Moses met by the burning bush. Then the Lord said to Moses, I have seen the troubles of my people and, and uh, my, so I've seen the troubles my people have suffered in Egypt and I've heard their cries with the Egyptians. Uh, when the Egyptians hurt them, I know their pain, he said. So really when you look at this, you can see God is saying, I have seen, I've heard, I know, I'm aware. He's saying, I know their pain. I've seen their suffering. I've heard them crying out to me. I know what they're going through. God knows exactly what's happening to every single person on this planet right now. He knows everything about everything about your problems. He, has, he, he knows your problems intimately to every detail, even details you are not even aware of yet. He knows. He, he, when, the Bible says, when the Bible says, I've seen, I've heard, and I know, it's not just, you know, he's not just receiving emails, you know, from Christians here on earth saying, okay, dear God, this is what's happening to my neighbor. He says, oh, okay, so now I know. Okay? No, that's not what it means. He's not just getting information. He's not just getting data from us when we pray. When he says he knows what, what that means, he's intimately, he has intimate knowledge about your situation. 
every situation of every person and every group, every nation, every community, every family, every human being on this earth. He knows everything about everything. There is nothing that he does not know. That's the truth. That's what it means when he says, I know. I know your pain. He says, I, I know their pain. When he says that, I know about it. I understand See, we think God is indifferent to our suffering, but this is not true. It is not true. It's just that, here's the thing. If he knows, then why isn't he doing anything? Well, see, that's the tricky part. Okay? This is the tricky part. And let me show you what I mean. Because there are certain things that God is also waiting for. The good thing about God, the best thing about God, well, not the best, but the good thing about God is that because he knows everything about everything, he knows exactly when to start moving on this person and this person and this person and this person because somehow their lives will collide and these are the ones that will help each other. And so he needs to get them to the place where they will be willing because there is this thing called, a, there's this, free, this gift that he gave us. And he cannot violate this gift. It's called free will. See, we have free will. And so he cannot, he can, but he won't, force us to do anything. He will not. Because it will violate the very gift that he gave us, our free will. So, he has to work with our wills. So this is what God said to Moses in verse 8. He says, now I will go down and save my people from the Egyptians. So God says, I know, I've heard about it, I've seen it, and I really know about their pain. I've, I've, I've seen it, I've experienced it with them. And so now he says here, I'm going to do something about it. I will go down and save my people from their oppressors, from the Egyptians. I will take them from that land and lead them to a good land where, they're, where they can be free from these troubles. It is a land filled with many good things. So here we see the heart of God. And we have to trust that the Bible is telling us the truth. So now God is saying in these two verses, God is saying, I know about your problem and I want to do something about it. In fact, I am doing something about it, and I want to bring you from your trouble to a good place. Amen? Aren't you glad that God is in the business of getting us out of trouble and bringing us to a good place? How many of you would like to be in a good place? Amen? Of course, all of us, we want to be in a good place. Now, God wants to do that. God desires to set us free. He wants us to have a life of freedom and liberty, free from the tyranny of fear and even death. Now, this is what I find interesting. He says, so look at what's happening. God is saying, I know about your problems. I know about your troubles. Now, I'm going to do something about it. And then this is what he says in verse 9, talking to Moses. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. So I hear them. I hear their prayers. I hear their suffering. It's moving me. So I'm going to go down. Verse 9. I'm going to go down. Right? And then this is what he says in verse 10. Come now, therefore, I will send you. I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, I want you to see what's happening. God is saying, yes, I hear your prayers. I know you're suffering. I'm going to do something about it. Now, Moses, you and I, we're talking right now. The fact that we're talking, that's called prayer. The fact that we're talking and you're talking to me about all these problems that's going on with your people who are actually my people, I want you to know something, Mo. I'm there with them. And I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to come down. And guess what? I'm going to look like you. Because I'm sending you. You're going to do it for me. 
you're the one that's going to talk to Pharaoh. You're the one that's going to deal with the oppressor of my people. You're the one I'm going to send. I will set them free, but I'm sending you to do it. There are people suffering, and God wants you to do something about it. Turn to your neighbor right now and just tell your neighbor, he's talking about you. Go ahead, tell your neighbor, he's talking about you. See, here's the thing. Many times we pray, but we're not prepared to be the answer to someone's problem. We want someone else. It's like Moses who said, here am I, Lord, send Aaron, send my brother. Don't send me, send somebody else. God said, I'm sending you, and he says, ah, send someone else. So really what's happening, the question is not whether God has heard our prayer, because he has the real question. You know, it's not even, Lord, are you even listening to me? Are you aware of our situation? That's not the problem. The problem is, are you willing to go? And be the answer to someone else's prayers. Think about that. Are you willing to go and be the answer to somebody else's prayer? To somebody else's problem? Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your best friend. Maybe it's your business associate. Maybe it's the person sitting right next to you right now. You know, whoever it is. Are you willing See, many times you just want God to move, but He says, yes, I'm moving, but I'm looking for someone to send. And then all of a sudden we shrink back. And we say, well, hmm. All of a sudden I think I don't want to pray anymore. I don't want to talk to God because He's always telling me to do something. Why doesn't He just do it by Himself? Well, He won't. You know why? Because we find the answer in Genesis 1. And Genesis 2, he said, let us make man in our image and likeness and let them have dominion over everything here that concerns planet earth. Let them. He, that means God excluded himself. God said, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make man and let them have dominion over the earth. So now, you want something done here on earth? Yes, we pray. Yes, we need grace. Yes, we need God's help. But He will not do it without you. Because the ones who have dominion over the earth is man. When I say man, I'm including the ladies. Man. What is man? Man is a spirit housed in flesh. This body. God is spirit, but He has no flesh. So He excluded himself from moving when it comes to earth. He has control over everything. He knows everything. But when it comes to earth, the only planet in the whole universe, he says, I will still have my way, but I will use man to have my way. And so in that sense, he limits himself, so to speak, and he waits for man. So right now, what he needs to do is he says, Okay, Moses, I'm sending you. And now he's telling us. Forget Moses. He's telling us, I'm sending you. You want to do about something about corruption? I'm sending you. You want to do something about mental health? I'm sending you. You want to do something about marriages in general? I'm sending you. You want to do something about the lost? I'm sending you. No, Lord, you just go ahead and do it yourself. No, I'm sending you. That's why the title is, Are You Willing to Go? If you don't go, he'll send someone else. But you don't get to share in the story. Because you deleted yourself from the story. We're so like Moses. Look at verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I? It sounds like us. Who am I? Sino ba ako? Who am I? What do I have that I should go to Pharaoh? Who am I to talk to him? 
I don't have the credentials. I don't have the name. I don't have the money. I, I don't have the influence. I don't have the business machinery. I, I don't have the education for this. I don't have the connections. Who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Who am I to do this great work? Who am I? See, Moses had problems, and we are so like Moses. We look at our lack, and if you continue reading the story, he says, but Lord, I'm slow to speak. I'm slow of speech. My tongue is, I'm not a good speaker. He says, you talk to Pharaoh. So I, I, I can't speak well. And he comes up with all these excuses about himself. See, here's the problem. He was so busy looking at himself. Who am I? Instead of, Lord, who are you? Oh, you're God. I can do this. Because God, the God of the universe, the sovereign one, the one who's all-powerful, is the one sending me. I can't lose. I can do this. See, because our eyes are looking at the right thing. But when the eyes are looking at the wrong thing, who am I? Stop looking at yourself. Stop looking at your inadequacy. Stop looking at your lack. Stop looking at what you don't have. The fact of the matter is, God is looking for those who are faithful, not those who are rich, not those who are educated. If you're rich, you're educated, you're connected, that's good. But that's not what qualifies you. What qualifies you is your availability. He doesn't even care about your ability because it is His ability. In fact, the Bible says, Paul said, I would rather boast in my weakness because it is in my weakness that His strength is perfected. So I won't even talk about how good I am. I'm just going to talk about how, how weak I am but how strong He is so that I can do this. But you see, we always come up with excuses. I, I don't want to do the announcements. You know, that's so scary to stop up here on stage. I'm not like Jeremiah. You know, he can talk in English. And he can say this. He comes up with all these nice stories and all that stuff like that. I mean, and so we, we discount ourselves. We disqualify ourselves because we are looking the wrong way. Who am I? Who am I? Stop asking who you are and start asking who is God. It doesn't matter why He chose you. The thing is He did. See, here's the thing. Moses was so busy trying to convince God that God made a mistake in choosing him. That's what he was trying to do. He was trying to correct God. Really, that's really what we're doing. And so when you talk about your weaknesses to God, now it's not bad to talk about, Lord, you know what? I know you want to send me. I don't know how to preach. I don't know how to share. I don't know how to give. I don't know how to do this and that. But you know what? Because you're sending me, I'll just make myself available. And I'm going to trust you. That's okay. But when you use your weaknesses as a way out, as a way to justify disobedience, then what you're doing is wrong. See, so talking about weakness by itself is not necessarily bad, but when you use what your, your perceived weaknesses as a justification for disobedience, it's still disobedience and therefore it is still sin. Yeah, I can't talk. You want me to talk? I can't talk. You want me to share? I have nothing to give. You want me to hug? I don't have arms. You want me to encourage? I'm discouraged. That's what happened to Moses. And like Moses, we too complain too much. Don't you realize that there are one of the reasons why you have problems that you cannot solve is because it was not meant to be solved by you, but by someone else? Because maybe 
You may not have the money, but someone else ha- does. You may not have the strategy, but someone else does. You may not have the connection, but someone else does. And God did not mean for you to solve all your problems because otherwise you will need no one. But you also have the answer to somebody else's problem. Because maybe you have the money that they need. You don't have the money that you need, but you have what they need. You may not have the connections that you need, but you have the connections that they need. And when you come in and become the solution to somebody else's problem, you open up a doorway for God to send someone your way to help you solve your problem. And one of the reasons why we have so many problems is because we, have, we, we, we don't take the many opportunities to be a help to other people. Well, when God helps me first, then I'll help others. God never works that way. The Bible says, give and it shall be given back to you. So it has to start with us. Help and you will be helped. Share and you will be shared something also. Encourage, and you will be encouraged. God always starts. You cannot get a harvest without planting first. Every farmer knows that. You got to plant first. You got to give to the ground first so that the ground can give you back. Well, you need money? Share with someone else. You need connections? Be a connection for someone else. You need encouragement? Be an encouragement to someone else. The reason why we have so many problems is because we are not helping people. Many of our problems stay because we are too stubborn to help other people. And we are so, sometimes so ignorant of how God works. And so because our eyes are so focused, well, you know what? I can't speak like Moses said. I can't do this. I can't do that. I don't want to do this. I can't do that. Lord, don't. I'm the wrong person. Get somebody else. And he's saying, look, I want to help you. So help someone else first. So I can bring someone your way. And that's why God said, you want to follow me? Deny yourself. First, Deny yourself. When you say, who am I? You're not denying yourself. You're thinking of yourself. You're pampering yourself. You're so kawawa. Oh, if you only know how much I'm suffering, that's why I can't help you right now. You don't know my pain. Well, guess what? You're not the only one in pain. There are other people in pain, but you are in a unique position. Just like what Jeremiah was sharing about that that person with cancer. So she has cancer. Is it a she? So she has cancer. But she's not dead yet. So in the meantime, help. The only time you're allowed not to help and you're given permission not to help is when you're dead. Turn to your neighbor right now just say, when you're dead. (laughs) See, that's the only time. Otherwise, help someone because when you help someone you're also helping yourself that's how this kingdom works that's why God said love one another bear one another's burdens that means you know what as you help someone carry their burden somebody will help you carry your burden we think I have enough of my own I'll help someone else pa. well that's exactly it Because yours alone is already getting too heavy. So you help someone that has a slightly lighter burden. Someone that you you have enough strength for. But that person finds that burden too heavy. But not for you. You can do their burden. Then someone, God brings someone and says, I can do your burden, but mine is too heavy. So God sends some to that person. You know, like an Arnold Schwarzenegger. And gets that burden because... You know, he's strong enough to carry that burden. But Arnold now is having a hard time. So he sends Arnold Passis to carry the burden of Arnold Schwarzenegger because he's stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. See? You know why? Because he is someone who praises. So here's the thing. We get so busy saying, who am I? And God saying, wrong. You're supposed to be asking, who am I? God that's sending you to do this.
Have you considered that perhaps one of the reasons why you're so miserable is because you have made everything about yourself? Everything is about yourself. Oh, I'm not well enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not healthy enough. I'm not big enough. I'm not rich enough. I'm not eloquent enough. Everything's, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not enough. You've made everything about you to justify your sense of entitlement. Rather, instead of me helping you, you should help me. See? You should go out of your way for me. Because you don't know how bad my state is. It's bad. Your state is bad because you don't want to help anybody else. You have become like the Dead Sea. A lot of water going in, but it does not send water out. And that's why it's called the Dead Sea. It's a metaphor. The Sea of Galilee was once fresh. Because water comes in, water goes out. The Dead Sea is dead because water goes in, nothing goes out. That's a sure way to kill your faith, to kill your joy. All of Egypt was waiting for Moses to respond to God's call. Here was Moses debating with God. I don't know, Lord. I think you made a mistake. I can't speak. I can't move. I'm old. I'm, you know, I'm 80 years old now. In the meantime, people were waiting for Moses to obey. And they were suffering every moment of his monologue with God. They were suffering while he was complaining. They were suffering while he was whining to God. Remember this, every time we disobey, you're not the only one that's affected. There are other people on the other side of your disobedience that are suffering because you are disobeying. And if someone else disobeys, and that somebody is supposed to help you, you will continue to suffer until that person obeys. Now God will not force your free will. So He has to work on you so that that so that now you will help someone which opens the door for someone to help you maybe that someone is ready to help you but god says not yet this person hasn't helped someone yet so you just wait there the moment he helps i'm gonna command you to go and help this person until then you just wait there lord what will i do with all my help what will i do with all my encouragement all my connections all my money you just hold on to it because this guy, I have to get him to obey first. To a large degree, other people's freedom is dependent on your obedience. And your freedom, to a large extent, is dependent on somebody else's obedience. God called Moses to be the deliverer of Israel from the land of bondage. And Moses needed to respond to God's call. Israel was waiting for Moses to obey. In the meantime, while he was whining and complaining, Israel was suffering and waiting for Moses. And he's saying, I can't speak. I'm afraid. I'm not prophetic. I can't preach. I'm scared of Pharaoh. He can have me killed. And even if I do go to him, will he even listen to me? I don't have the credentials. I don't have the connection. I don't have the right last name. And so while Moses was trying to weasel out of his obedience, there were people suffering, waiting for him to obey. And all Moses was doing, he was so busy thinking of the inconvenience. I'm okay here taking care of a few sheep in the backside of the desert. I don't want to have to walk all the way back to Egypt and try and convince all the people of Israel, God sent me. Who are you? What's your name? 
How do we know you're the one? Lord, how am I going to convince three million people to follow me? So while Moses was busy looking for more inadequacies, people were suffering and waiting for him. Let me close with Paul's dilemma. If anyone can complain, it would be Paul. And you can read it in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm not going to do that right now. But he talked about how he was stoned, left for dead, and, and shipwrecked, alone at sea, oftentimes hungry, naked, cold, freezing, in danger in the city, in danger in the countryside, in danger among the Gentiles, in danger among his own brethren. And on top of all of that, he said, the burden of the church rests on my shoulders. But this is what he said in Philippians 4, verses 11 and 12. I'm telling you this, not because I need something from you. I have learned to be content. This version uses the word satisfied. With what I have with whatever happens. See, what he's saying is this. Look, whatever happens to me, I don't complain. I'm content with what I have. Not what I don't have, what I have. I've learned to be content with what I have. I know how to live when I'm poor and when I have plenty. I've learned the secret of how to live through any kind of situation. When I have enough to eat or when I'm starving. When I have everything I need or when I have nothing. He learned to be content. And what he's saying is there were times when he had plenty and there were times when he had nothing. There were times when he was, stummy, was, uh, his tummy was full and there were times when he was hungry. But he was not fasting. He just had no choice because there was nothing to eat. There were times when he was freezing because he didn't have enough clothes on him. There were times when he was in danger. And he says, in all these times, I have learned the secret of contentment in every situation I have. So here's what I'm trying to say. Paul said in verse 13, Christ is the one who gives me the strength I need to do whatever I must do. In other words, if God says go, you don't say, but wala akong pamasa. I don't have money. He goes, just go. Money will follow. Just go. I don't know what to say. I'll put the words in your mouth. I don't have the connection. Someone's waiting for you. In other words, you go and whatever is outside your ability that's where grace steps in. That's why I married Grace. She always steps in. <laughs> but seriously, see, when you are unable, Christ becomes your ability. Christ becomes your power. Christ becomes your provision. Christ becomes your strength. Christ becomes your connection. He's the one that will open doors that no man can shut. He's the one that will keep people out and close doors that no man can open. He is the provider. He is the healer. He's the one that makes you whole. He's the one that blesses your business. He's the one that will fix your family. He's the one that will fix your health. He is our all and all. He is enough. He is gracious. He's a grace is still to this day amazing. It is still amazing. The question remains, are you willing to go? And allow God. See, your miracle is in the place of obedience. Stop justifying your disobedience. Stop justifying your comfort zone. God comforts the afflicted. If you're not afflicted, do not expect the comfort of God. He comforts the afflicted 
but He also afflicts the comfortable. When you get too comfortable, that's why you'll notice in your life, it is your life on this side anyway, before we die, will never be perfect. Don't wait for it to be perfect. It never will be. Because when it's perfect, you don't need God. There will always be something in your life that you cannot handle by yourself. And the key is by helping someone else. By helping someone that you can handle so that God can bring someone that can handle your problem which is right now beyond your ability. And in so doing, we learn to bear one another's burdens. We learn to love one another. We learn to pray for one another. We learn to, to, to hug one another and be there for one another because that's the only way. God has to keep some things from us for now so that we can step out in faith. And when you do, the provision comes. The help comes. I look up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from people. It comes from the Lord. But the Lord will send people. Maybe right now, whatever it is that you're facing, whatever it is that you find impossible, yes, it, because it is. Because you were not meant to solve it yourself. Let God bring someone your way. In the meantime, open your eyes to opportunities that God sends your way and help others. That's one of the reasons why even for our mental health seminar, if you really want to go but you don't have the money, go. We'll find a way. We'll find a way to cover the cost. We'll find a way to, you know, and there's food. The 300 is not just for the seminar. It includes food. We'll find a way to pay for the food. We'll find a way because we want to help. Because when we help, we get helped. We get helped. So do not pass up opportunities to be a blessing to others. It's not always about money. Sometimes it's just a hug. Sometimes it's a how are you. Sometimes it's just a handshake. Putting your arms around their shoulders. Sometimes it's a word of encouragement. Sometimes it's just connecting that person to another friend. And that's, it won't cost you anything. But God has called us to be a blessing. So let's be a blessing. Amen? Let's be a blessing. Look for opportunities. There are, you have friends that the person next to you will never be able to reach out to. But you can. And maybe they're lost. But you're the right person to say, you know what? I know someone who can help you. I want you to meet him. Come to church. Not realizing that they will meet Jesus here. But who knows? They might meet another person here that just might be the right person to help them. Or they're coming to church because you obeyed and they followed you will open a door to them and God can bring someone their way. God is the one that orchestrates all of this and He works through our free will. And so the question now is, is your will free enough to obey? Or is your will still bound by chains so you cannot obey even if you wanted to? I think it's time we stop making excuses. Amen? Turn to your neighbor right now and just say, let's stop making excuses. Include yourself there. Let's stop making excuses. Let's start helping people. Amen? Let's start helping people. I think we can do this. Amen? I think we can do this. You can always be kind. You can always be gentle. You can always be loving. You can always be helpful. You can always be an encouragement. There is always a way. Amen?